Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is birds designed to thrive. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Lorraine Doyle. Lorraine, thank you so much for being here today. I'm excited to dive into this topic. Let's go ahead. Thanks very much, Sunny. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be able to um, share a little bit about um, these incredible creatures. Um, and so today really is, um, it's a little bit of a, um, a smorgasbord for want of a better expression. Um, so I'm really just dipping into um, some of the interesting um, facts um and kind of unique things about birds um that perhaps we overlook um i think certainly on safari the first thing obviously everyone comes for is um is mammals um, especially the big five um but i think we have such an extraordinary diversity of um, birds in in southern africa that it really can add a whole nother level um, of interest um, to a safari um, if we start looking if we start looking a little bit more towards um, avifauna as, as well as as well as mammals so this is probably um, the most photographed bird in southern africa um, i think anyone who's been on a safari will recognize it um, as a lilac breasted roller um, and just one of probably the most beautifully coloured birds that we have um, in, in Southern Africa. Um, not the most beautiful of voices. Um, so better that it doesn't sing because it really doesn't have any sort of a song. It has a real um, raucous kind of cawing sound, um, but it certainly um, makes up for in colour what it might lack in voice. So, sorry, let's just see if I can get this to move. Um, oh, so this is just for anyone who um, hasn't tuned in before or um, met me. Um, I'm in the middle there with some of my amazing colleagues that I get to work with um, at um, Medikwe Safari Lodge, which is one of the lodges that we go to on um, our secluded South Africa safaris. So just a very brief um paint sort of paint strokes if you will about just the origins of birds um and i think perhaps we sometimes overlook how ancient birds really are um and they modern birds descended from a, a group of two-legged dinosaurs um, known as theropods and so if you think about that um and in many ways they haven't evolved from that they've descended from that and so um it's not too far a stretch to say that we actually still have living dinosaurs in the form of birds um and one of the interesting thing is that um bird specific features like feathers um actually began to emerge in dinosaurs long before the birds um, actually um, kind of developed and split away, if you will. Um, and so it just shows that sometimes pre-existing features are adapted um, by um, other creatures um, to make them um, fit for purpose, if you will. So um i think it really does when you start to think about this it starts to change your perception um, of how kind of unique um, and amazing birds are um so one of the close relatives if you think about theropods um would have been um tyrann things like tyrannosaurus rex now obviously that whole um transition if you will didn't happen overnight so you've now got birds getting bipedal locomotion then feathers um, then they got a wishbone which is very unique to birds um, and then feathers and then obviously wings 
Um, and so if we look, um, and this is probably one of the most famous fossils um, that many people will recognize, um, known as Archaeopteryx lithographica. Um, and for a long time, this was considered to be the first bird. Um, and um, modern science has shown that really what um, Archaeopteryx was, was more of a transitional fossil. So it still has a lot of the characteristics of a reptile, um, but you can see the imprints here of feathers, um, showing that it did um, possess feathers. Whether it could actively fly um, or whether it could only glide, um, these are things that we really don't know. Um, but we're looking here back about 150 million years, and there are many more fossils now that have been discovered in recent decades. So um, the first Archaeopteryx fossil was um, discovered in 1861. So we've now gone forward into the 20th and indeed into the 21st century, um, and we've started to see now um, a lot more fossils, particularly from China, um, being discovered um, that, again, um, perhaps change the way that um, we look at the development of birds over time. So this is a constantly um, changing process. Um, and I think it's just, it's a really um, amazing thing to think um, that, you know, that this history um, of birds is, is, still, um, is still out there. So if we look at birds, modern birds, um, I think one of the things that strikes us most about birds is their ability to fly. Um, and it's that um, capacity or ability which has made them able to um, fill niches um, around the globe. Um, and so one of the things that um, comes to, to mind is, well, why then do we have some flightless birds? Um, and about 60 species of birds in the world currently um, cannot fly. So it's about 0.5% um, of the world's, there's approximately 100, sorry, approximately 11,000 species of birds. So why do we not see more flightless birds um, around? Why are they not here? And um, this is where humans have played a part. Um, scientists have looked and said we would probably have at least four times as many flightless birds on Earth if it wasn't for humans. Um, and the one thing that perhaps will spring to mind um, the most likely is obviously the dodo. Um, and so what happened with these birds, um, flightless birds, is we think that these birds would have um, been on islands. Um, and so what happened that they there were no um, predators there. Um, and so the need for wings and flight, um, which are expensive, um, were not needed. Um, and so their wings became increasingly um, residual. And one of the species that we have here in, in Southern Africa um, is basically the, the world's largest flightless bird. And um, so this is the this is the African ostrich. Um, and so what's happened here is um, their feathers of what we become what we call um, degenerate. So flying birds will have hooks on the barbs um, of the wings that actually help hold the feathers um, or keep them together in a sort of an aerodynamic um, structure. And that's disappeared. Um, and as you can see here, um, this male ostrich has got this very, very fluffy appearance. Um, and so, the function of those feathers has has changed completely. Um, so they've survived um, in competition with mammals, um, partly due to their incredibly long legs, meaning they can run really fast, um, and also 
um, especially with our ostriches here in Southern Africa, um, an incredibly powerful and dangerous kick. Um, and they're quite unique amongst birds in having only two toes. Um, and I know it's not really that obvious here, but the nails on those toes um, are incredibly heavy and dense um, and make them um, really quite dangerous. If you can notice here, um, this male ostrich has got bright pink shins currently. Um, and that's an indication of a male in, in um, during the breeding season. Um, and a long time ago, I was fortunate enough to be in um, Eswatini, um, what was Swaziland, walking with a little Swazi tracker. And it was incredible because we had done an approach. We had approached some elephant. We'd done an approach on some rhinos. And he was quite comfortable. Um, and then he heard this big male ostrich booming. Well, I have to say, I've never run back through the bush to a camp as fast as I did that day. Um, because he was just so firmly um, of the opinion that these this was incredibly dangerous and we really, really didn't want to be anywhere around this animal. Um, so again, I think sometimes we think of birds being a lot softer, if you will, than, than mammals. Um, but this is certainly um, a bird that is not to be trifled with. So this is a close up. Um, so he actually looks a little coy in this picture, but I just wanted to um, show you, they have this um, incredible gizzard, um, which, is, which is basically a muscular chamber um, that allows them to break up their food. And um, ostriches, you'll often see them picking up stones. Um, and they can have as much as 1.5 kilograms of um, stones, which we call gastroliths, um, in the in the gizzard um, and the purpose of that is is that it's an adaptation for them to be able to grind up their food um, to a, a more digestible consistency they never excrete those stones um, the stones eventually start to wear down and then the bird will consume more um, ostriches are not the only ones to do this um, but um, they certainly um, are probably the ones that have um, the most or the heaviest um, gastroliths um, in their gizzards. So just thinking about birds and their design in terms of thriving and how have they come to be so successful um, in being dispersed across all the continents of the globe. Um, and I think that there's two real things that have, um, have favored that, if you will, along, alongside flight. And that is, is that they have an extraordinary diversity of feeding and breeding strategies. Um, and that's what we'll kind of spend um, the rest of this webinar really looking into um, using some Southern African examples of this. So, there's what might look like a rather strange photograph of a bird where we can't really see its head. Um, this is typical of a bird called a black heron. Um, now, obviously, there are many different herons. Um, you know, you get grey herons, which occur um, across um, Europe, America, and and, um, and Africa. Um, but this particular heron has this. Um, bizarre behavior of making this canopy. So what it does is it will open up its wings like it is done in this picture. And then very often it will stir with its foot. So you'll see this little bit of movement um, of stirring. And what we believe that happens um, and what this does is that little bit of movement attracts a fish because it thinks, oh, well, there's something here in the shadows um, and it must be safe because it's quite shadowy, um, so I'm not exposed to predators um, out in the open. Um, and of course, that um, becomes a fatal mistake for the fish because um, the heron is primed, ready to 
to eat it. Um, and I've sat watching these birds for a considerable amount of time. Um, and they almost do um, what we jokingly called daytime, nighttime. So they'll put out their wings, um, so nighttime, and then they'll pull their wings in and then they'll move along a little bit and then they'll do, they'll just keep repeating the process. Um, and it certainly seems to be a successful feeding strategy. Um, it's interesting that we don't see it, um, certainly not as overtly in other species, um, certainly not the shading. Um, the foot stirring is quite common, um, but this whole shading um, um, action is, is really quite, quite unusual. So I know this is a little bit of a, a sort of a gray photograph, but um, I wanted to include this bird because it's a really, really strange bird. Um, so this is known as an African harrier hawk. Um, it used to be called a gymnogene. Um, so it's got this bare face, um, and I think you can still see on here um, some yellow. You can actually see the yellow on the face. When it gets into hunting mode, um, or if it gets um, distressed in any way, that bare facial um, skin will flush bright pink. Um, and so you can literally watch this bird's face transition from yellow to bright pink. Um, at the top of the screen here, there's a starling, which is very unhappy about the presence of this gymnogene. Um, or harrier hawk. Um, and the reason for that is, is that um, they have the most incredible legs, um, which almost appear to be what we would consider double jointed, um, to coin a phrase. So they can actually bend their, their feet backwards and forwards. Um, so they can get their um, legs into incredibly small crevices in which there are nestlings or eggs um, and so then they'll actually then pull out the nestling chick or an egg um, which is why in this situation um, the starling is looking particularly unhappy um, and it really is quite extraordinary to watch them clambering around in trees um, because it really, they look quite ungainly um, in doing it because they use their wings to keep balance. But quite a, an amazing adaptation. Um, so giving it a niche, if you will, that other birds, other raptors are not able um, to exploit. So that ability to get food from a, from a niche that is not otherwise being exploited um, certainly helps make them um, a successful a successful species. So this is another um, really amazing bird um, called a secretary bird um, and it's actually endemic um, to sub-Saharan Africa. So what that means is, is that it occurs nowhere else on earth. Um, and if you can see um, on this photograph, you can see it's long, um, very long legs um, and very, very powerful claws um, on those feet. And what they do is they pretty much stomp on their prey until it dies. Um, so usually lizards or snakes, um, and they'll literally trample them um, to death. So um, there was some researchers, and I can't exactly remember when this was done, but there was an adult male um, secretary bird that was trained to strike at a rubber snake on a force plate. And um, it was actually found to hit that rubber snake on the force plate uh, with a force equal to five times its own body weight. So, and a very, very short contact period. Um, so they use what we believe visual targeting to target the head, um, especially if it's a snake, because it wants to make sure that with one strike, um, especially if it's a venomous snake, um, and I've seen them taking um, 
Egyptian cobras or um, things like even Mozambican spitting cobras. So obviously snakes that are um, particularly venomous. So it's really important that you have great accuracy and great downward force um, when you actually um, stomp on its stomp on its head. Um, so they have and very unusually long legs. I mean, if you look at this and you consider other birds of similar size, some of some of your cranes um, and so on, they, the secretary's bird's legs are nearly twice as long um, as other um, ground birds of the same body mass. So we believe that this is linked into um, it's an adaptation to its incredibly unique way of hunting um, and yeah, literally striking and stomping on the head of, of things like, like snakes. So again, it's exploiting another niche um, that is not actively utilized by many other birds. Um, and so it just gives them um, an advantage, um, a survival advantage. So just moving away from sort of the slightly bigger birds um, to looking at some of the relationships that birds have formed over millennia with mammals. Um, so these little white birds here um, are cattle egrets. Um, and what cattle egrets do, um, as well as this um, other bird, which is known as a fork-tailed drongo. So what these birds do is they hang out around mammals that are moving through vegetation um, and as they do that they flush up insects and then these birds swoop in and take those flushed insects um, and as you can see this um, fork tail drongo has got very well developed um, quite hooked hooked beak um, which is an adaptation for um, eating insects um, it also has bristles around its beak called rectal bristles um, and those um, have either a sensory function so they can detect um, insects um, as well as possibly acting as a funnel um, so funneling the insects into the beak um, something that happens as well with birds such as um, night jars so we call this commensalism so there's no advantage to the mammals. There was no advantage to those wildebeest, but they weren't harmed by the interaction either. And the egrets and the forktail drongos benefited. Um, and so they were, so one side benefits and the other is not harmed. Um, and that's a relationship known as commensalism. So a bird that's taken, um, kind of an interaction with a mammal host to a completely another level um, are your oxpeckers. Um, so this is a red-billed oxpecker, um, relatives of starlings um, and incredibly intelligent birds. Um, and they are um, incredibly well adapted to their um, relationship with the mammal hosts that they live um, in association with. So they have very, very um, long um, toes and they also have needle-like claws. Um, I know this because we actually um, have a rescued oxpecker um, that unfortunately um, can't be released because um, its wing is, it has a, a really badly damaged wing. Um, and when it wants to clamber around on you, um, it really hurts. Um, hence, only animals sort of bigger than a warthog and um, will actually allow oxpeckers to clamber around on them. So if you see oxpeckers trying to settle on very small antelope, um, they'll often get just shaken off. And part of that is because it's literally like being um, poked at with needles. They also have these very short stubby tails um, which act as a prop. Um, and if you watch them feeding, they use their bill like scissors. So they actually have this like sideways uh, motion that they utilize to go and comb through the, the hair so that they can actually get to the ticks. Um, and the ticks is really what they are after. Um, 
So in that situation, we would say, well, it's a fairly mutualistic relationship because the mammal's benefiting and so is the bird. However, the reason that the bird is eating the ticks is because the ticks have been sucking blood and so they're full of blood. And that is actually what the oxpecker is after. And so sometimes what happens is these oxpeckers will then keep wounds open and delay the healing of wounds on animals because they're keeping it open so that they can take um, the blood. And in that situation, it becomes more of what we would consider a parasitic relationship um, because the mammal is certainly not being helped by it. In fact, it probably is being harmed, but the oxpecker is still benefiting from it. Um, what they also will do um, is they'll often, you'll see them flying off with a beak full of hair that they've taken off their mammal host, and they'll use that to line their nests. Um, so yeah, a very um, um, highly, uh, highly adapted um, to um, their, their way of life. So another, another bird that is um, really incredibly well adapted to the niche that it fills um, are things like vultures. Now I know a lot of people um, will kind of wrinkle up their noses when we think about vultures, but vultures are a critical part um, of ecosystem function. So um, without vultures to clean up carcasses, we would have a lot more disease um, in these environments than we do. Um, and so these birds um, with their bare um, skin around their um, head and neck, um, that's so that when they've got their head deep in a carcass, um, it, the feathers don't become all matted and soiled um, with blood, which would potentially um, form an infection risk. Um, and we also think now that their bare heads are quite a good way of losing heat. So their feathers are quite dense because they soar at great heights when they're thermaling. Um, but when they land on the ground, um, and it's obviously a great deal hotter than when they're at higher altitudes, they need a way of losing heat. Um, so one of those ways is, is that they urinate on their legs um, for evaporative cooling. Um, but the other seems to be that they can actually lose quite a lot of heat through their bare heads, um, which is um, a, a pretty useful adaptation. So this is just one of our different vultures. Um, so just to have a look. So this is a white-backed vulture. Um, Normally the lappet faced um, is, is our biggest vulture and that will, that's literally like the can opener that will open up a carcass, followed um, very often by white backed vultures. Um, and then these guys are the last ones to come in. Um, so these are hooded vultures and you can see it's got a very narrow kind of pointed um, face and bill. Um, and that's for getting into all the little crevices. So this is the one, the, the vulture that comes in at the end and is picking off the meat between the ribs um, and doing the last of the kind of cleaner um, crew um, work that the other vultures um, haven't completed. However, without the lappet faced vultures, um, other vultures really can't open up carcasses. So they would then have to wait for something like a hyena or something else to open a carcass before they could access it. Um, so yeah, very much kind of a whole hierarchy, if you will, um, of these birds that help us the cleanup crew. So looking um, at birds that um, have quite an interesting adaptation to an aquatic way of life, um, most birds like ducks um, will have um, preen glands and they will have an oily secretion on their feathers, which enables uh, water to run off um, the proverbial water off a duck's back. Um, these birds, however, um, so these are African darters, um, also known, sometimes known as snake birds, um, because their body will be submerged under the water and you'll just see this neck, um, which kind of looks a little bit snake-like. Um, and so these are underwater feeder 
um, these birds are underwater feeders and their feathers are actually designed to become waterlogged so that they're not fighting buoyancy while they're trying to feed. So it enables them to dive deeper. They can stay underwater longer um, and they don't expend any unnecessary energy. Um, so that's a very different strategy from things like ducks, um, which would have a huge problem um, if they were to get their feathers completely waterlogged. Um, so, however, the compromise of this is that very often when you see African darters or any of our cormorants, reed cormorants and so on, out of the water, they will always have their wings exposed um, and they really need to um, leave the water quite frequently to warm up. And then obviously this open wing posture is very essential um, to drying out their wings um, because they need to dry their wings to warm up um, and then they can then go and repeat the process. Um, so again, another strategy that birds um, have, certain birds have um, adapted to or evolved in order to fulfill um, a specific niche. Um, so um, bee eaters, um, some of our beautifully colored, um, beautifully colored birds, this is a white fronted bee eater, um, they've got an incredibly long bill if you have a look at how long their beak is and that enables them to eat, to catch and hold bees without getting stung. So they'll actually catch the bee and then if you watch them, they'll actually rub the bee's abdomen against a branch and they'll remove the sting of the bird before they swallow it. Um, so yeah, a very um, specific strategy. I mean, they will eat other flying insects, not only bees, but when they do take bees, and um, that's the strategy they use for, for, for killing them. Um, and then you get completely different shaped um, beaks on birds. So this is um, one of our parrots. We don't have many um, parrot species um, in Southern Africa. Um, so there's a gray headed parrot and they have a diet which comprises almost entirely of the kernels inside of seeds. And so they need to be able to crack um, those open. Um, and if you can see here, they've got um, actually, you can't see the one toe that's behind. So they have what we call zygodactylous feet. They have two toes pointing forwards and two back. Um, and what they'll do is they'll hold whatever it is um, that they're wanting to crack. Um, they'll hold it in their claws and then put it in their, into their beak and crack it. Um, so um, if, if you actually look at um, the hook of the tip of a parrot's beak, and I mean, these are not particularly big parrots. This is not like an African gray parrot, for example. Um, that, that hook at the end actually lets them lift the kernel out of the cracked um, seed once they've managed to open it. Um, so yeah, very, very um, specific bill for a specific purpose. Um, then we've got um, some of our woodpeckers. Um, so we have a number of different species. Um, this is uh, a female golden-tailed woodpecker. Um, and the time of woodpeckers um, is completely unique um, because it can extend at least three times the length of the bill of the woodpecker. So it's actually attached at the base of the bill and it wraps around the skull. Um, part of which helps with cushioning the blow of when they strike um, at wood. But this incredibly long tongue covered with a very, very sticky, almost glue-like um, saliva um, and little barbed hairs on their tongue enables them to put their tongue down into these um, holes um, that they have made in, in wood and actually extract um, whatever it is um, in there that they are wanting to wanting to eat. Um, so here you can see um, she's actually got her bill inside um, a hole that she's made using her short tail um, as a prop 
um, much like ox peckers do. Um, and a blow from a woodpecker's bill um, can strike a tree at about 24 miles an hour. So obviously, um, if it um, the shock of that blow, if it were to be transmitted straight into the brain of the bird, the bird would be knocked unconscious. Um, so the brain actually lies well above the level of the beak. Um, and then there's also a cushioning um, at the base. There's muscles at the base of the beak, which actually act as shock absorbers. Um, and that's how these birds can repeatedly strike um, at wood um, and not knock themselves senseless. Um, so again, very specific um, design for a very specific purpose. Um, this is another one of our um, pretty amazing Southern African birds, and this is an African hoopoe. Um, so they have this beautiful um, coloration and this crest on their head. But one of the things as well that's um, very interesting about them is they have these very strongly, what we would call a decurved bill. Um, and their method of feeding is, is probing into grass um, and soil. Um, I think this one um, on the um, at the back um, of the picture, it seems to have picked up something, uh, maybe even a snail um, in its in its beak. Um, but you'll often see them; they will go along on um, open areas, sometimes on lawns, um, at lodges, um, and you'll see them probing um, and then pulling out whatever it is they find, um, and then consuming it. Um, they're whole nesters um, and they're not particularly picky about where they choose to nest. Um, so I've seen them um, nesting in holes in the ground um, and then also holes in trees. Um, so they are not the cleanest of birds. So many birds are quite fastidious um, in terms of removing um, feces from the nest or from chicks and so on. Um, not so hoopoos. Um, so if yeah, if you happen to um, investigate a hoopoe nest, be warned it's it's pretty it's a pretty smelly nest. So this is a bird called a Dederix cuckoo, um, and cuckoos are really quite extraordinary birds, um, both in terms of some of their biology um, and also their breeding strategies. Um, and this particular cuckoo, Dederix cuckoo, um, will often consume um, poisonous and very spiny caterpillars. Um, and adult cuckoos have a very specially adapted gizzard. Um, so it's got a soft, thick inner layer um, to the gizzard. And what happens is the pointed hairs of the caterpillar go into the gizzard lining. Um, and then patches of that mucous membrane plus the hairs will peel off and are regurgitated. Um, so, however, um, this is not developed in young cuckoos. And so if young cuckoos were to try and do the same thing, um, those spiny hairs together with the toxins would probably kill or well, would kill the cuckoo. Um, so what did it, what cuckoos, um, do as well is they're what we call brood parasites and so what they do is um, they outsource parenthood completely so the female will find um, the nest of a host bird um, Dederix has about 24 known host species some other cuckoos are more specific um, and they will she will lay her eggs and leave um, and it is then left to the poor host bird to now rear the chicks um, of this um, brood parasite. Very often the chicks are much larger than those um, of the um, host bird. Um, some will coexist with the host um, chicks, others will push the, um, the host chicks out of the nest or, um, or kill them. Um, but a very, very um, interesting strategy for breeding because you just lay the eggs and 
there's very little energy or time invested um, in raising those young. Um, and so um, technically you're able to lay more eggs in the season because you're not having to now sit and brood eggs um, to uh, yeah, and raise and raise the raise the chicks. So this is um, a Birchall's Kukul. Um, he's very, very fluffed up here. Um, and just included because it's a member of the cuckoo family, but unlike cuckoos, um, they actually do um, raise their own young. Um, and they're very often seen sort of skulking around in the bushes um, as they go because they feed on, on eggs and nestlings um, of other birds. Um, but unlike their cuckoo cousins, um, they actually do invest um, in raising their own young. Um, just some of the extremes that birds will go to um, in order to attract mates. Um, and this is a long tail paradise wider in breeding plumage. Um, for the rest of the year, when not breeding, these birds are very kind of nondescript, um, look much like the females, um, which are really just um, very sort of mousy, um, almost sparrow like birds. But in breeding season, the males grow these ridiculously long tails. Um, and it is um, obviously the females are attracted to the males with the longest tails um, because that will show very strong genes. Um, not only is this, um, this bird um, actually able to still fly, albeit like a brick, with this tail, but it survived being taken out by. Um, a raptor or other predator. Um, so if you are able to survive with this ridiculously long tail, then you must be good breeding, um, have good breeding genes. Um, and so the females will um, select the males with the longest tails. Totally different strategy um, in the African jacana. Um, just look at those toes. Um, they're sometimes called lily troshes. Um, because they um, are able to run kind of along um, lilies or vegetation um, in the um, in the water. Um, and African jacanas have got a very, very um, different strategy. So um, they practice something called polyandry, which means one female has many males. So polygyny is much more common. So like in the um, long-tailed paradise wider, there will potentially be one male and many females. But here, um, the female um, African jacana will lay the eggs and leave. Um, and it is up to the, um, up to the male um, to do all of the raising and protecting of the chicks. Um, so what is, the, um, what is the benefit of this? Um, and so, Essentially, what we believe is that you've only got one parent needed to raise the young. Um, and the female can maximize her reproductive success um, by mating with more than one male and therefore having multiple nests um, through the breeding season. Um, so it's a strategy that is it's not practiced by very many birds i think it's probably about one percent of birds um but it certainly seems to work for um the african jacana what's also interesting is um in polyandrous birds like the jacana the female is actually larger and sometimes more colorful than the male which is the complete opposite of most bird species um, and this is just um, a little jacana chick um, being watched over by, um, by dad. Um, sometimes what will happen is if there's a threat, the chicks will all go under um, the wings of the male. And you just see this male with lots of very, very multiple long toes. Um, it's a very, um, very strange but cute thing to see. Um, so. Some other species of birds have developed um, other methods of courtship um, to attract mates. Um, and what happens is birds like this um, southern moss weaver build these nests 
Um, they'll weave them at the end of branches, um, often at the end of thorn tree branches to stop snakes being able to get into them. Um, and once the male has completed a nest, um, he will then display um, by singing and um, a little bit of a, um, a little bit of elaborate wing um, flapping. And that's to attract the females. And the females will then come, a female will then come and inspect the nest. And if she accepts it, um, then she will mate with the male and lay eggs. Um, if she rejects it um, as not up to standard, um, the male will actually pull down the nest, destroy it completely and start again. Um, and so, again, the, the whole genetics behind this is that, well, the better you can weave, um, you know, the stronger um, and the better your genetics probably are. And this is why the females would want to want to mate with you. Um, so just another one of our really um, interesting birds um, is uh, southern ground hornbill. Um, and these birds are critically endangered. Um, for, for a number of different reasons, but they are actually the largest known cooperative breeding birds in the world. Um, and so by cooperative breeding, it's a strategy where you have one breeding pair, and then you have a family group, um, which help with raising the young. So it's not just um, the alpha male and female which raise the young, um, you've got um, a bigger um, group to raise. Unfortunately, um, they, will often only um, raise a chick uh, once every nine years. So they have a very, very slow reproductive rate. Um, and that's one of the reasons um, that they face challenges in terms of um, declining numbers. The other is that a lot of big trees um, in areas are being chopped down. Um, and so their specific nesting requirements are sometimes being compromised um, because of habitat habitat loss. Um, so this is another one of our weird looking birds. It's called a hamakop, which literally translates to hammerhead um, from Afrikaans. And um, they live largely on frogs and tadpoles. Um, as you can see in this photograph, that's not all they feed on. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what this hammercorp had picked up out of this, um, looks like potentially rhino dung, but it had picked up something. Um, but that's not their traditional diet. Um, their more traditional diet is associated um, like this one here, um, this very muddy pond. Um, it had been uh, stirring the bottom um, and had obviously caught something um, in its beak. They actually make, um, as a pair of birds, they make the largest nest um, of any pair of birds in the world. Um, and for anybody who's seen them, um, you'll know it's this enormous pile of sticks um, that they put into trees near, near water um, and almost have a very small entrance hole in the middle. So it's very, very well insulated um, and quite well protected. Um, Sometimes you'll have other birds nesting on top of it. So I've seen um, the rose eagle owls using the top of the nest um, and the hummercorps using the inside of the nest. Um, so yeah, a bit of time sharing going on. Um, other birds that have got um, strategies that have allowed them to expand into areas that are really quite arid um, are birds um, called sand grasses. Um, so this is a double banded sand grass male. Um, and the males have got these very specially adapted breast feathers. Um, and what they can do is they can submerge those breast feathers in uh, water and absorb the water like a sponge. Um, they can then fly um, as far as 35 kilometers. So a very long distance um, with this additional weight um, back to a nest um, where there are chicks um, and the moisture will actually then be stripped from the breast feathers by the by the nestlings. Um, so the females don't do this and um, this is um, kind of the exclusive premise of the males um, and 
yeah, so there are many different species of these sand grass, um, the macro sand grass, um, and several others. Um, but this one is quite quite widely spread, um, and it's certainly one of the species that we see on um, secluded South Africa safaris. Um, so this was just to, we've sort of looked at quite a lot of different bulls um, or beaks on birds and how that relates to diet. Um, and this is just a typical seed eaters um, diet. So a very short conical stout um, beak that they have. And um, this is a bird called a violet-eared wax bulb. Um, a very, very pretty bird, um, pretty tiny, um, about half the size of, um, yeah, about the size of a sparrow, I suppose, a little bit smaller actually. Um, but yeah, with this heavy conical bill um, that allows them to pick up seeds um, and eat seeds. Um, for anyone who watched um, one of the recent webinars I gave um, that was looking at birds in different environments, um, we actually had a look at this bird, but it's one of those birds, um, those species that is really um, quite extraordinary. Um, so this particular one is um, a purple crested Turaco. Um, we have several other Turacos, we have a Nisner Turaco, Livingston's Turaco. Um, and what's so unique about these birds is they um, contain red and green pigment. So the red pigment is called turicin, um, and the green is called um, turacoverdin. And in most other birds, when you've got um, red coloration, it's due to things called carotenoids. Um, and with green, it's often um, a, re a result of kind of um, blue um, and yellow pigmentation. So it's not a true green pigment. Um, and these turacos are the only birds in the world um, that have this, these specific pigments of this specific color. Um, so um, why exactly this might be, um, I certainly don't know. And I haven't actually um, really delved into the scientific literature on it, um, but it's certainly a very unique um, adaptation of these birds. Um, so they are largely frugivores, um, so fruit eating, um, and this one was sitting, I think, in a um, jackalberry tree, um, and so it has um, a re relatives known as the grey go-away bird, um, which doesn't have any of these beautiful colours, um, but um, also occurs um, in sort of sub-Saharan Africa. And then this was just um, to just briefly look at sort of the ecological role that birds play. So often we'll look at birds and think, well, they're very attractive, they're pretty to look at, um, but do they have any um, function, if you will, within an ecosystem? And the answer is yes, very much so. Um, so when we look at um, kind of ecological roles or ecosystem dynamics, um, we can look at a number of different what we call ecosystem services. So provisioning, uh, regulating, um, cultural and supporting, um, and then not necessarily always positive or completely positive. Um, so if we look at the positive ones, um, things like ecosystem balance, um, they are pest controllers, so they um, will eat things like grubs that are eating crops. They will eat um, many of the not so pleasant insects. Um, they maintain a predator prey balance between birds, species that are prey and those that predate on them. Um, in terms of cultural services, um, scavenging, I guess, has in this instance on this paper was put un, under a cultural service, um, largely because they are, as I said earlier, the cleanup crew. Um, and without them, we would certainly be in a lot more of a mess um, than we currently are. They also very actively disperse seeds. Um, so whether that's through droppings or whether it's through um, getting stuck on their beaks. 
So they actually will now help dis disperse um, disperse seeds. Um, and then obviously, if we look at birds in terms of um, where humans um, might use them for meat, for eggs, so there's a provisioning service to them. The disservices can be things like crop damage, and this particularly when you look at birds like quilias, um, tiny little birds um, that if you have a huge swarm of them go through will actually um, can de destroy an entire crop in a matter of minutes. Um, so not necessarily always positive, um, but certainly they do have um, a strong ecological role um, as well as being um, really interesting to to watch while on safari. So thanks very much um, for listening. I hope that just perhaps unpacked birds a little bit more um, and perhaps on safaris now people might start to look at them um, a little more actively. So thanks very much. Thank you so much. I learned a ton and I will not look at birds the same way now. <laughs> Um, we have got lots of questions for you and just a little bit of time. So I'm going to just see how many we can get through. Cool. Um, let's start with, um, do you know why the birds thrived after the asteroid blast that killed the dinosaurs? So possibly because of their small size. Um, so the things that were most impacted by the striking of the asteroid, which we think is what led to the dinosaurs' extinction, um, were large-bodied creatures. Um, Smaller-bodied creatures, um, which included um, the precursors of mammals, were actually able to survive. And by that time, um, the the birds had actually, um, or the bird predecessors if you will, um, had already, already kind of um, reduced in size from some of the, the huge dinosaurs. And we think that that's possibly um, small size allowed um, things that survived uh, the, uh, the, the asteroid impact to survive. Fascinating. Um, is it considered better to feed the birds or not feed them throughout the winter season? So I think certainly in um, areas where you have extremely harsh winters, um, I don't think that there's any harm in in feeding them. So long as what you're feeding them is the types of things that they would naturally um, have access to during the um, the feeding season. Um, it's not something really that is such an issue in Southern Africa because um, we don't have the harsh winters um, and the extreme lacks of, lack of food. Um, but I don't think it's a, a necessarily a bad thing. Um, I think we just have to be um, certain that we don't feed them things that they wouldn't normally eat, like bread, for example. Okay. Do birds breathe differently than mammals do? I've heard that it, that is why they are more affected by smoke and air pollution. Um, so yes, they do have a different, um, they do have different lung um, function and lung structure. Um, so yes, their breathing um, is different um, to mammals. Um, and I think certainly their exposure to airborne particles of pollution um, would, would make them more susceptible um, to inhaling um, pollutants than perhaps um, you know, mammals which are not necessarily directly in contact with mm. those airborne particles at such concentrations. Okay. What characteristics does the female weaver bird look for in assessing a male nest? Um, so it's a good question. I'm not sure I entirely know the answer, but what I have seen is the more neatly woven and tightly woven um, the nest is, the more likely the female is to accept it. So 
if it's quite messy and it's got bits sticking out that haven't been neatly tucked in and the weaving of it is a bit loose um those are often the ones that will be rejected um so i think mm -hmm. perhaps the tightness of the weave and then also the shape so different weaver birds produce different shaped nests um and i think the female will also judge um how well will this specific nest that this particular male will it hold the eggs um pro you know will it hold the eggs properly or is it such that you know the eggs are going to fall out um, mm -hmm. so i think that that possibly uh, might have something to do with it got it all right let me ask you one more we'll squeeze in one more um do you have any idea why the hornbill lays eggs only once in nine years and how many years does a, thorn, a hornbill tend to live? So hornbills, um, they can lay um, eggs more frequently than that, um, but they tend to only raise a chick to adulthood um, successfully about every nine years. They're very long lived birds. Um, so there's been um, records of birds living for um, over 60 years. Um, so unlike some of your smaller birds, which um, have produced many more, um, many more eggs, um, live a far shorter period, you've now got birds that um, only raise a few young over a long period of time. Um, so they're very long lived and they have the strategy of not necessarily raising um, or being able to raise a chick to adulthood um that frequently they also um the other strategy which is um seemingly counterproductive is that they practice something called cain and abel syndrome so the first hatched egg and um, the female will lay two sometimes three eggs the first first hatched chick once the second um egg hatches or the second chick hatches um will um, either actively kill the older chick will kill the younger chick or the younger chick will just be completely um, ignored um, and will ultimately land up perishing. It seems to be that it's possibly an insurance policy um, in case for some reason something happens to the first, um, the first egg. But what it has led to is there are conservation organizations now who are um, taking those second eggs from the nest when they are laid um, and then raising those chicks and releasing them back into the wild to try and boost the populations. Um, so yeah, it is a little bit of a, a mystery as to why they are not particularly um, successful in terms of their breeding strategies. Hmm. Well, that is the last question we have time for, but I just want to thank you for a fabulously interesting presentation and echo the the comments um, in the the questions box that just um, are really appreciative of your passion and knowledge in this area and are asking for more. So thanks again. I'll hand it back to you for any closing comments. Um, no, just really to say, um, yeah, thanks very much um, again. And um, I hope everyone has a good rest of their week. I also want to thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, we'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone.